Republican Congressman Peter Meyer of Michigan congratulating Trump-backed opponent John Gibbs, who narrowly defeated Meyer in this week's Republican primary. This was, this was a hard-fought race, uh, decided by less than 4,000 votes out of over 100,000 cast. Um, you know, it was, you know, a, a long race, but a race that John ran very well. Just want to now officially introduce, send my congratulations, and wish you the best of luck and all that is to come. Meyer was one of the 10 House Republicans who voted to impeach Donald Trump and his opponent, received a major late-inning fundraising boost from Democrats. Joining us now for his first television interview since the primary is Republican Congressman Peter Meyer of Michigan. Congressman Meyer, you fought the good fight. You represented your constituents and your conscience and defended democracy, but you came up short in this par partisan primary. It was close. Less than 4,000 vote margin separated you from your opponent. So do you think that the Democratic Congressional Committee's major ad buy in the last week of the campaign made the decisive difference in your primary. Uh, good morning, John. And I'll be honest, it's impossible to know. Um, I can Monday morning quarterback all day long. Uh, I'm not here to whine about the DCCC coming in and meddling. Uh, but just to point out that any party that pretends to have a set of principles, any party that pretends to have a set of values, and that comes in and boosts exactly the same type of candidate that they claim is a fear to democracy, a threat to democracy, don't expect to be able to hold on to that sense of, of self-righteousness and sanctimony. Don't expect to have Republicans who will look at that and say, you know, I know I'm going to get heat from my own side. I never expected the other side to as well double down in a cynical ploy uh, to put forward the candidate they think is less electable. I think the challenge in this moment, and this is not why I want to complain about my own defeat, I lost, that's on me, but is to say what type of a system are we going to have if candidates step forward and realize that they can just be ejected by both sides of the aisle, that there's no incentive to try to be a productive member, uh, that you will never find any semblance of comfort or, or safety in doing the job, that it all will come down to partisan benefit no matter what the consequence. That's the point I really want to get to today because, you know, voters want government to work, but these partisan extremes don't. And, and there's, a, there's a, a contradiction there. But just for clarification, because we played uh, your, your, your comments to, your gracious comments to your, your, your opponent uh, at the top, he promoted not only Trump's lies, but a whole boatload of conspiracy theories. Um, was this just good sportsmanship on your part or is it an outright endorsement? I, I hold the seat that Gerald Ford held from 1949 to 1973, and I think what would Ford have done in these circumstances? And I find it ironic that many on the on the anti-Trump side of the aisle are frustrated uh, that I didn't act like Donald Trump and, and that I conceded the election, uh, that I wasn't a sore loser, that I congratulated my opponent. Uh, to me, that is just being a civil, courteous person and should be the bare minimum we expect of those who are in our political environment, rather than acting exactly uh, like the type of politics that um, I, I frankly stand against. Well, civility uh, is, is something we all need to see more of, and I think you've, you've represented that time and again. I want to talk about that, the political incentive structure that you called out and talk about uh, how to confront it. But first, I want you to take us behind the scenes, right? You were one of 10 lonely House Republicans who voted your conscience, um, and the partisan primary structure is set up against you in some way. But I wonder, take us behind the scenes, how often do you hear your congressional colleagues privately say that they know Donald Trump is lying, they know he lost the election, but they're afraid to say so for their political career or their personal safety? How often do you hear that? It, it, well, uh, I'm not the first to have said it, but if we had secret ballots in Congress more often, I think you'd be surprised by what the results would show. And I think that's part of the problem. And frankly, that's the case on both sides of the aisle. We can talk about Donald Trump and the, the need to impeach. On, on the one hand, uh, we can talk about support for Nancy Pelosi or, or just belief in some of the more extreme progressive policies on the other. Uh, the average member of Congress is trapped between their partisan priorities of either their party or kind of dominant officials within it, and then what signal that sends to the most passionate pluralities of their primary voters torn between that and actually trying to accomplish their jobs. And I think 
I've seen so many officials in, in Congress, I think of Kurt Schrader in Oregon, who has tried to moderate and, and frankly tried to prevent some of the excesses of his party, trying to prevent some of his colleagues from having to walk the plank on unpopular pieces of legislation that are not going to pass. You know, he was primaried, and just like in my case, where once the uh, incumbent is primary, the seat tilts or changes that likelihood of flipping. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he had a toss-up seat that went lean D. I had a toss-up seat that went lean D. I think both parties are playing this role of trying to eject uh, some of the members who are best capable of holding on to their seats. And that is just going to lead to slimmer majorities. It's going to lead to more uh, flipping between sure. extremes and, frankly, more partisan chaos. Look, g given that there are more independents self-identified than Democrats or Republicans, that moderates make up a plurality of voters, but... You know, do, do you think those voters feel politically homeless? Do you feel politically homeless? And what do you think can be done to, to bridge these gaps? Now, John, I'm a Republican. Um, I have been a Republican. I will be a Republican. And my motto going in was with my shield or on it, not compromising on values, not compromising on principles, and understanding that that could have a very severe political cost, uh, a, a political cost which I have paid. You know, I think at the end of the day, it's important to try to work within the parties that we have, but that doesn't mean there aren't larger structural reforms that would allow parties to try to have a bigger tent. I've talked to a lot of candidates running for office who say, you know, I consider myself a Republican, but if I go down the laundry list of things that I need to recite in order to not get eviscerated in a mm -hmm. primary, I'm not willing to do that. Mm -hmm. All right, so there is an urgent need to undertake some of that structural reform. Look at the three Republicans who right now um, are on track to win re-election who voted to impeach. They're all in either jungle or top two primary states, right? There's a lot of ways Very in which how our candidates are chosen that I think we need to be looking at and understanding how to appeal to the broadest swath of the electorate so that we have representatives who are truly representing the people they serve. Couldn't agree more. You Look, you put country over party. Uh, you voted to impeach President Trump. So if there is a 2024 rematch between Biden and Trump, would you vote for President Biden over Trump? Well, I, I've said it before. I think if, if in 2024 we're back to a, a Biden-Trump dynamic, it'll be a pretty sad commentary on where our country is. We have young, fresh, rising leaders on both sides of the aisle. And that symptom of just defaulting uh, to the choice that, frankly, not a lot of people want, but they feel, you know, well, if there's anybody who can... Or, Mm -hmm. I put it this way. I mean, Biden has beaten Trump, right? So there's a Democratic argument that if Trump is put forward, Biden can beat him, uh, despite Biden already being the oldest president we've had in office. Uh, and Trump, uh, well, basically anyone on the Republican side could probably beat Biden, right? Like, that is a very messed up and frustrating and depressing dynamic where we're just settling for the lowest mm -hmm. common acceptable denominator rather than advocating for folks that make people passionate, excited, and thrilled about what the future may bring. So, so uh, I'm hearing you not answer the question directly, but what I'm also hearing is you'd write in somebody else and support somebody else. You, you would choose none of the above. Fair? Yes or no? I don't want that matchup in 2024. You don't want that matchup. Uh, Derek, what, no. One final yes or no before we go. Um, you fought the good fight. You lost the battle. Uh, are you keeping the door open? To running for office again? No, oh, absolutely. I'm not on the ballot in 2022. I'm, I'm not campaigning in 2022, uh, but I plan to stay very engaged in politics and, and frankly, trying to continue to make an impact, um, probably more at the local level within West Michigan, but certainly wanting to influence the national dialogue as well. Congressman Peter Meyer, thank you very much for joining us on New Day. Thank you, John. All right. Let's bring in CNN political commentator extraordinaire, S.E. Oh, Cup. thanks. You're welcome. Great interview. What did you make of uh, Peter Meyer's comments? Oh, uh, I'm so sad because he's exactly the kind of politician we need right now. And for four or five years, I listened to Democrats, rightly, um, admonish Republicans for putting party over country, for putting Trump over country. And I watched them beg for more Peter Myers and Adam Kinzinger's and Liz Cheney's. And it's not just the blood money that they're putting um, behind folks like Peter Myers' opponents. It's like redrawing Adam Kinzinger's district so yep. that he effectively couldn't win. Yep. Congratulations. You just got the last remaining stopgaps 
out of Congress. So color me cynical, Democrats, when you, you know, talk about folks like Meyer being the last thing remaining between the civilization and the Visigoths, which I agree, um, and then you don't do exactly what you could to help him stay there. You ask folks like me to go ahead and cross party lines and vote for Biden, which I did, and lots of us did, because we put country over party. Made the difference in some swing states. The favor has not been returned.